Half-Life is one of the most influential games of all time, and a key reason for this is its modability. Long after most people had played through Half-Life's campaign in 1998, they were still glued years later to the screen by something else and that something else was probably running on gold source. Almost 25 years later, that legacy of modding is the reason why I'm here today talking about Half-Life once again, and this time in the form of Half-Life Ray Tracing from Sultim Srendeshev, yes, the maker of ray traced versions of Sirius Sam, Doom, and Quake hath turned their luminescent visage unto Half-Life, making it anew in their own image. Jokes aside, that is all this video is about today what Ray Traced Half-Life is, how it utilizes ray tracing to remix the classic game, and also a bit on performance and more for those of you who want to run it on your very own personal computer. And to do that, you'll need to know how to install the ray traced version of Half-Life, and that's really simple. First of all, download the latest Steam version of Half-Life. Then head on over to Soul Team's GitHub page for the project and download the necessary files and install them exactly as instructed there. The GitHub page for the project reveals that we are not actually seeing a ray traced version of Gold Source here, aka the rendering engine that powers the original Half-Life. Instead, Ray Traced Half-Life is a fork of XAsh 3D, which is an independent and open source 3D engine in its own right that just happens to have extreme levels of compatibility for gold source formats and code. Basically, since Valve never open sourced the original Half-Life engine, people over time have taken that matter into their own hands to ensure Half-Life's legacy could exist outside of Steam on PC. Half-Life RT builds on this by replacing the rendering portion of that engine with a Vulkan-driven path tracer. With the new version of the renderer, the art textures and models are nearly all the same, and the key difference is now how these objects are going to be lit and shaded. To talk about how path tracing affects the game here, we need to know how the original Half-Life was rendered a bit. In 1998, Half-Life was designed within the limits of CPUs, graphics accelerators, and system memory of the time. Real-time lighting was extremely minimal. You had a semblance of real-time lighting in the modern sense with the game's flashlight, which projected light and shaded the areas affected by it in a per-vertex manner, but that was rare in the game and most of the lighting was actually done by light maps, where direct lighting and radiosity, also known as bounce lighting, were calculated offline and projected onto the world with textures. The lighting textures are usually wholly static, but they could also be toggled on and off or swapped out rapidly to give the appearance of dynamic lighting in the world. A neat trick like we're seeing here with this flashing light, but it was time consuming to author and limited in fidelity as you can imagine due to the resolution of the textures here. Still, it works for 1998, and the light mapping gives Half-Life its cozy look, and it's also why Half-Life looks so darn good. Even now in 2023, I think the game looks spectacular, and it's due to how clinically and consistently it is lit. The light maps made for the game show light emanating from the objects and in places your mind expects them to be coming from, and objects getting in the way of that light have shadows cast from them. Like here in the office complex section of the game, a table with a lamp on the right is emitting light and brightening up the area in front of the couch on the left, and there's a dark shadow cast behind that couch. We can see the physical principles of lighting here, it's just at a lower resolution and static. There's a level of consistency of how rooms are lit in Half-Life, and it's used throughout the entire game. There is only very rarely lights placed in a fake manner, like here inside this pipe where there's no artificial lighting in the scene, so for gameplay purposes, they lit up these pipes with some fakely placed lights so that it is not pitch black. This was done rarely though in the game, and like I said, the original Half-Life otherwise has a painstakingly logical way of doing lighting, and this extends to bounce lighting. The original game, the sky, emits light in its own right usually, which will make shadows away from the sun take on a grayish blue look. The sun itself can also bounce light around the scene, like here we can see how the sunlight peeking into this area is bouncing the tiniest bit of light onto the adjacent walls. For 1998, this was top end stuff, and this way of scientifically propagating light around the scene made the game look the way it does. Because the game was lit this way, it's also perfect for path trace lighting, which slots elegantly into Half-Life. That original super consistent lighting method lends itself perfect to a path traced conversion. Salt Team has gone in here to ensure that 
lighting of similar intensity and style is emitting from those same places found in the original game. And as a result, the path trace lighting is extremely faithful. At times it produces results that look almost identical to the static light maps of the original game, just with more detail and more dynamism. Take for example that shot I showed off earlier in the office complex. With the path trace lighting here, the lighting is coming from that same lamp and direction with the same color and everything, just now the lighting is pixel accurate and dynamic instead of a low resolution static texture, so this means we can see the scientist is now included in the lighting calculation. He's a dynamic object that casts shadow in its own right and light bounces off of him. We can also see that the shadows now are much sharper, like the one casting behind the couch. In a shot like this one, the difference is more subtle from the path tracer. In other shots like this one, where a fan is moving, it is much more dramatic. The same lighting positions as the original game, but now the lighting is dynamic and also of a higher resolution, so the spinning fan blades cast shadows around the room and shadows onto themselves. Dynamic objects being included in the lighting now is a big difference from the new path tracer. In the original game, dynamic objects like character models or moving bits in the environment sort of stuck out in an odd way like we see in most games that are lit with light maps. Dynamic objects are just lit differently than the rest of the static world. Now they are lit the same way because of path trace lighting. So now even small moving objects have lighting consistency that you would find across the rest of the game, like this bowl in the microwave here. The original light map lighting doesn't really affect the spinning bowl here, so it just kind of looks gray and has no shadows casting from it. Obviously the new path traced version of that bowl in the microwave has shadows, lighting, and more affecting that bit of moving geometry. Another aspect dialed up to 11 due to the path tracer is found in the light bouncing around. Bounce lighting is present in the original game, but it is limited due to the light map and what objects were included in that light map to be tested against. Don't forget, all of the lighting in the original game had to be calculated for long periods of time offline. Now lighting is done in real time, and more objects are included into that lighting calculation. So you see some enhanced results here. Like check out that scene I showed off earlier. There's a similar level of bounce lighting visible from the sunlight hitting the ground here, but now it propagates around the scene more. And notably, the color of the sky is also more prominent in those shadowed regions. That is something you will see consistently throughout the game now. In shadowed regions outside of the sun's influence, the sky lighting will show through more. This will take areas that were once more gray colored and shift them towards the blue color of the sky, which is honestly a bit more reflective of the actual hue of blue found in the skybox texture in Half-Life. I really tend to love this new, more obvious influence of the sky lighting, such as in this scene here, where it gives this catwalk more obvious directional lighting from the open sky shining through on the left-hand side. You can even see indirect shadows from that sky being visibly cast from Barney and the rafters above. So as you can see here, there's a greater directionality and intensity of global illumination effects in this version of Half-Life. This includes indoor locations as well on a much smaller scale. Check out this scene here in the office complex. The original has the light angled down here and bouncing light off that desk, albeit in that low fidelity way you would expect from a gold source light map. In the path trace lighting, you can see a whole magnitude of difference here between the sharpness of that shadow being cast from the lampshade to the intensity of that more reddish hue of light bouncing off the table and around the room. It even visibly affects the dynamic object of that med kit nearby. One of my favorite aspects of Soul Team's path trace renderer here is actually how it supports emissive surfaces, much like the radiosity light mapping from the original gold source. So pools of toxic waste give off that same lambent glow like they did in the original game. But now of course, there's an added touch of dynamism and accuracy. So moving objects will tend to look better around these pools, and there's not gonna be light leak from thin objects like you could see in the original game, such as here where the light map is low resolution on the left hand side, and I can't represent the thin geometry of the catwalk here correctly. So you can see green light shining through to the other side, which should actually be dark. Emissive lighting is used much like it is in the original game, so many areas with it will look very similar, but there are also some areas where there's some emissive light being added in. Remember that pipe I talked about earlier with the fake lighting in the original game? Well now, 
in the path traced version of the renderer, that fake lighting is gone, but to still make it lit up for gameplay purposes, there's a added bit of a glowy toxic sludge here lighting up this pipe instead. That's a nice little neat detail added in here that keeps within that Half-Life theme. Soul Team had to go in here and update this area manually so that it still looks right and also plays well with the more physically plausible renderer that a path tracer is. And talking about this little addition here that Soul Team had to manually do brings me to some other larger scale things that the path tracer adds here. Everything I've talked about so far to this point in this video is actually not so different from what the original Half-Life did with its rendering. Just now with the path tracer, it is done in real time at a lot higher fidelity. To go the extra distance here though, Soul Team has made some other additions to take it up an extra notch above what the original Half-Life did. And one of the biggest additions is in reflections. So all the lighting I've been showing off in other scenes so far is primarily diffuse lighting. Like if you look at this nondescript corridor here between both versions of the game, they both look really similar. On the right hand side with the path tracer, you can notice that there's no shiny surfaces at all really. Most surfaces are matte on purpose, I would say, just like the original game. There are not really complex materials in the new path traced render like we would see in a game such as Quake 2 RTX or Portal RTX. Rather, the textures and materials here are just as matte as they were beforehand. That's less realistic rendering as a result, but it's also more faithful to the original game. This applies to most textures in the game, and it's another reason why the left and the right images here can look so darn similar at times. But that is not a universal statement. Soul Team has specifically gone in and made some textured surfaces have a bit of reflectivity. One of the most obvious new materials is the replacement for the shiny texture in the original game. See, in the original game, objects like the Magnum or Gordon's HEV suit used this chrome texture, which is almost like an environment map. When an object with this texture would move, it kind of has a shiny appearance. It's totally fake, but man, this was the 90s. And this stuff looks cool. In the path traced render, Soul Team has updated these materials with a 90s ray trace look, as I'm gonna call it, with really sharp reflections. Now the revolver reflects the surroundings around it in a super intense chrome mirrored surface like way. It almost looks like pre rendered concept art in a way that I particularly like. This applies to all those objects in the original game that used this shiny texture trick, such as Barney's helmet, as we can see here. Another addition are light metallic properties for a few scattered objects, like the shotgun shells we can see here in that same scene. Nearly every texture in the shot is fully diffused, except for the shotgun shells, which you can notice give off a brighter directional reflection like you would expect from metal. The other light material work Soul Team added is to first person weapon models, like the Tau Cannon. Notice how the original gun has that fake reflection texture on the copper bits. That's been replaced with reflections in the new version, but also notice the reflections in the original version that are drawn into the blue canister and the metals there. In the path trace version on the right hand side, that drawn in reflection has been scrubbed away and replaced with some more subtle material work so that those objects now look more like dull metal. This applies to all weapons of the game, where weapons now have very subtle normal maps and materials on them that generally keep well within the Half-Life art style. There's nothing too fancy or different here usually. Well, beyond on the crowbar that is. The biggest change with added materials is found on transparent surfaces and water. Now there's added in reflection and refraction to such surfaces. I don't really have too much to say here as it's really obvious just looking at the side by sides but yep you get true perspective correct reflections from the world on dynamic objects in water and in glass now. Those were just not there before. Sometimes it's more subtle and other times it's really obvious depending upon the surface and how dark the area is behind the surface. The second to last addition here to talk about in Half-Life ray tracing is the addition of lit fog or volumetric lighting. Back in 1998, Half-Life did not really utilize fog like many of its contemporaries did, such as Unreal for example. So rays of light through fog, like you can see in the intro train ride, were just done with transparent geometry hand placed in the world. They did this for a couple of scenes in the game. With the path traced renderer, such volumetric lighting is done with a per light ray marched approach. 
This gives Half-Life really obvious beams of light when they do show up. This will replace that geometry effect for most scenes in the game, but also adds in volumetric lighting to a ton of other scenes that did not even have it before. The second group of zombies you face off against, that's a bit grayscale in the original, now it's much darker and moodier with volumetrics. These new volumetrics are found in a ton of scenes that just weren't there before. This is one of the more obvious artistic changes from the original, but one I generally like and also applaud as it's not really expected to be added. It meant that each scene had to be gone over by hand, but this light type being manually added in. That must have taken quite some time. The last addition to Half-Life with the patch traced renderer here comes generally from post-processing. In the footage you've seen so far, there is a touch of bloom to the lighting in the patch race renderer, which is generally very subtle in indoor scenes, but it can bloom out more when you're outside with exposure and eye adaptation being added into the mix. But just like every other path traced game from Soul Team, all of this post processing can be tweaked or turned off to your liking. The bloom, for example, can be toggled off in the graphics options menu like you see here. And more complex things like sky intensity, watercolor, volumetric lighting, and more can be tweaked in the console or via an auto config file. You can make this game look any way you want with the console settings here. If you want it to look different, it can. Just change it. And remember that everything you're seeing on screen is optional right now. Nearly every single change from the original Half-Life can be tweaked or turned off. And that brings me to one last option that Soul Team added in here. And that is the ability to render the game with classic lighting, as it is called. This is accessed in the menu, as you can see here with this option. This keeps the reflections of the new path trace renderer, but gets rid of all the additions from path trace lighting, volumetrics, and more. So if you do not like the new additions to lighting wholesale, this is a nice way to play Half-Life with some benefits of modern ray tracing. Altogether, Soul Team's work here to path trace the original Half-Life is wicked cool. It's a fresh way to play a classic game, remixing it into something new, and it gives you a lot of options to tweak how it looks if you dig deep enough. I loved the time I had playing the game again, and I can really see the amount of work and dedication that went into making all the fine little details and added things, a number of which I didn't even talk about as there's time constraints in making a video like this. So I'll say it simply, Ray Traced Half-Life is the real deal, and I recommend everyone who can play it does. And if you do end up playing the game with ray tracing, I have some suggestions for you for performance and image quality. First of all, if you are on an NVIDIA GPU, do not use the suggested DLSS.DLL from Soul Team's GitHub page. That is the default developer one from NVIDIA, and I honestly find it a subpar model for most released games. For example, in this game, using that 3.1.10 version has added ghosting all over the image that just doesn't happen, for example, in the 2.5.1 DLL, which I grabbed from Tech Power Up. So definitely use a different version of DLSS. In regards to performance, there aren't really options here to tweak for performance beyond resolution, FSR, or DLSS. It is a mod after all, and not a fully released game. But still I have some recommendations, and I have them based upon a custom time demo of this scene here that I made which has combat, animations, and explosions going off for good measure. I found this time demo to be heavier than most other portions of the game. With this time demo I was able to get a good sense of what resolutions will be needed for 60 FPS on a couple of GPUs. For the cross-vendor comparison, I was able to see that that the RX 6800 XT is usually around 60% the speed of an RTX 3080 in like-for-like -like scenarios with this time demo at native 4K. I would have loved to shown off this bench with other resolutions here, but as you can see on the frame time graph there, this game enforces VSync at all times, which makes our FCAT based frame rate analysis tools rather defunct. This divide though in performance generally means the following. An RTX 3080 will do 4K DLSS in quality mode at 60, while an RX 6800 XT will require FSR 2 performance mode at that same resolution for 60 FPS. On the low end, this bench also showed off quite well that an RTX 2060, the base model, will manage 1080p60 quite well by utilizing DLSS in quality mode. So Half-Life with ray tracing does scale down rather well to a low end RT capable GPU, albeit not every GPU. The ARC A770 unfortunately did not boot the game in my experience. Access denied. And with that being said, we're at the end of this video. 
Ray Trace Half-Life is a really well-made remix of the classic game's visuals. I think the amount of dedication and attention to detail Sultim has shines through perhaps best with this specific Ray Traced remastering in comparison to the others before. Also, it's out there free as a mod, so the PC community owes Sultim their gratitude, I think, for all this hard work and dedication, and I hopefully have shown off a bit of my gratitude in the course of this video. If you did like this video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to see this video in high quality, support us on Patreon to get years of our work in high quality for download. Other than that, comment below, follow on Twitter, and as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen!